Welcome everyone to another uh, uh, data system seminar. Our speaker today is Phil Bernstein, uh, who's a distinguished scientist at Microsoft Research. Uh, he also has an affiliate professor position at University of Washington. Uh, prior to his current uh, position, Phil was in my, at Microsoft uh, as a product engineer, architect uh, in the product group and uh, served at Digital Equipment Corporation. He was a professor at Harvard and Wang Institute of uh, Graduate Studies and uh, VP of Software at Sequoia Systems. Um, Phil is uh, very well known for a lot of his work, uh, particularly in transaction processing. His books are, are uh, well known and I, I suspect many of us have seen it. And uh, he's a fellow of ACM and uh, AAAS. He has won the uh, EF COD uh, Contrib uh, Innovations Award from SIGMOD, and he's a member of the Washington State Academy of Sciences and the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. His uh, uh, B.S. degree is from Cornell and MSc, and his Ph.D. is from up the road from University of Toronto. Um, uh, some uh, uh, some uh, went to Toronto Database Group was at its peak. So thank you again, Phil, for uh, for the lecture, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you for your the gracious, uh, gracious introduction. So I'm going to be talking about um, work today that uh, was done with um, Shizhen Zhang, who actually is now on the faculty at the University of Toronto, um, still working remotely and waiting for a reason um, to, to resume his start his job where it's supposed to be in Toronto. Um, but um, unfortunately, Shizhen is not available. Um, to be here today, so I'm um, doing this. I'm giving this talk alone, and this work is 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 um, motivated by the trend toward disaggregation in computer systems, particularly in data centers. And it, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start out by by giving some motivation and just showing you what the opportunity is um, with with disaggregation, particularly disaggregation of memory. Um, and then we'll eventually get into the details of the mechanism we've developed to exploit that capability. Um, so um, the goal here is, is, is gonna be to figure out how to use RDMA accessible memory um, in a data center particularly um, to support um, database services. And the um, the reason why this is why this is interesting is that network latencies are getting low enough that uh, remote memory is although it's not as fast as as local DRAM it's, it's still on um, order of uh, maybe one order of magnitude uh, higher latency it's still much lower latency than accessing um, solid state disk in, which uh, which makes it a, a very um, a very interesting technology for, for data management. After all, database system would put the entire database system in main memory if it could. Um, some applications it can, but most of the time it can't. So if there's memory around that, that's accessible at low latency, then there should be lots of uh, lots of scenarios, lots of opportunities to make good use of it. Um, that. Um, because we're using the our goal here is to use memory in the data center that, that normally would just would go to waste, um, that just is sitting around on, on machines that that um, they they, um, they have spare memory available, but we can we can access it using using um, RDMA or some other network protocol. Um, the um, it, it, the problem is that that um, this the, both the workload and the availability of memory um, um, can change um, it can change pretty rapidly as virtual machines are allocated and deallocated, and so it, it kind of makes more sense to use this memory as a cache rather than as a permanent main memory home for the data. Um, there is still there's lots of it available, 
Um, it just that it comes and goes. Um, some of it is there because when you map virtual machines onto physical hardware, sometimes after you've allocated all the cores, yeah, we still have some memory left over. Um, and also because it's it's hard to grow virtual machines. And so um, people tend to, to um, allocate virtual machines that have more memory than they need just on the off chance they might need it because it's so painful um, to deal with um, the extension of, of the VM to get more memory, um, which is something that we, we can offer them so that they could maybe be not quite so um, conservative in their, in their VM allocation, the memory allocation of the VMs. Um, and the networks are getting faster. Um, and in fact, it's, you know, it used to be that the network was the technology whose performance was in, including the slowest. You know, it was getting more memory every year, faster CPUs every year. Um, now it seems like the network is actually improving at a faster rate than, than almost anything else. Um, so to uh, the, the numbers, I, I when I first saw them, I, I found them really astonishing that that um, the median amount of of Azure memory, this is you know worldwide across large number of data centers, um, is forty six percent. I mean, forty six percent of the memory sitting around in boxes in Azure. Um, this is this is a measured number, um, and. You know, even at the first percentile, you know, like sort of like the most um, testing, the, 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 the worst situation, um, you find even there, you find 28% um, available. And the, the, and the, but on the other hand, it's quite variable. The daily peak to trough is, is, is 2x. So whatever you do here to use that memory, you've got to be um, light on your feet to be able to respond to changes. The extreme case is you've got a server, all of whose cores are have been allocated, um, but there's still memory left. So that memory is stranded. I mean, you can't do it with, you, know, you can't do anything with it, um, except it turns out you can actually with RDMA, as I'll, I'll show you. So even with no cores at all, it's it's possible to make use of that, that stranded memory. Um, how much memory is stranded? Well, again, the numbers are, you know, probably bigger than you, you know, you might imagine. Um, that um, you know, on you know, the median at the median, um, it's eight percent of the memory is, is stranded. Um, one thing to note is is that memory has has been a growing fraction of the hardware spent for data centers. I think it's now the largest. I think if you look at um, money spent on networking and CPUs and on memory, the memory actually is the biggest um, um, is the biggest cost. Um, and it's not so much because memory is getting more expensive, it's just that everything else is getting cheaper. And you know memory has not been um, lately it's 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 getting a little bit cheaper, but for there was a long period in 10 years where it really wasn't getting cheaper at all. Um, Notice that the stranding um, duration of memory um, is is measured in minutes, which of course is an eternity for a for a processor. But on the other hand, it means you can't. Um, if you want to use the stranded memory, you're not going to be able to allocate it for hours. You're going to have to be able to to move your data around between machines, depending on which machine that has the memory available that's that's stranded at any given moment. Um, so that's the backdrop, and and now the question is how are we going to how are we going to use the memory? Um, that um, I think Tanner may have mentioned. I'm, I'm happy to take questions along the way, so so I want to interrupt any time. So the um, so what we want to do is use this memory that's available um, as a, as a cache um, for applications. Um, and so we want to have an easy to use um, general device abstraction. Um, and and the, the way we built it is, is um, we have a client, we think of it as a client proxy that's sitting co-located with an application. And it offers a set of, of capabilities um, to uh, create and use the cache. So you can create a cache of a given size. Um, and and then what that's going to do is it's going to create what looks like a a um, contiguous 
quite addressable device um, of, of that size, which is located somewhere in the data center. Um, but the, the application client has no idea where it has a real impact. Um, the, um, the client can then read and write that memory space, um, that um, byte strings in the memory space. Um, it can grow or shrink the amount of, of address space that, that comprises the, uh, the cache, this, the, um, the memory cache. Um, and of course, it can delete the cache when it's, when it's done using it. Um, to um, be able to access this memory efficiently, it's going to use um, remote direct memory access. Like the image. And the, isn't everybody's heard of or maybe you haven't heard uh, many of you may not know the details of how it actually works, but it's going to be very important. That is deeply into, into that later in the talk. Um, and the, um, the accesses, the RDMA accesses, are going to be to um, fixed length regions. So, you know, we don't expect that we're going to be able to get um, as enough memory on one machine to satisfy the needs of the application. Um, and the, for recovery reasons, as we'll see, it's beneficial to keep the length of these regions to be not too big, an order of like one or two gigabytes. Um, and then, and, and they may be on different machines, but again, the client doesn't know that. It just, it just, it's, it's just um, all hidden behind this, this client API. Um, so they may actually be mapped to, to different servers as shown here. Um, now, the accesses are going to be the RDMA. RDMA is a network protocol um, that is executed by the network interface card and the NIC. And, and, um, and it, allows the, you know, it allows the client NIC to directly access memory on the remote, on the remote servers. Um, so when a, when a client does a, um, does a read or a write, it... Um, it can it, it will send that read or write to the remote mix, um, which will then be able to directly access access the memory. And depending on the way RDMA is used in a given request, the server on the remote machine may or may not be um, active, may not be part of the picture. Um, in other words, the RDMA NIC does have direct access to the memory, um, but in some cases. The um, the access is going to be mediated by the by the server that's that's um, hosting the memory that's being accessed. Um, so let's let's look at RDMA now, just in, in a bit more detail. So um, we make the RDMA make look bigger, so that we need to to show um, some of the internal details here. Um, so when the application talks to the network through the NIC. Um, it has a, a what's called a Q pair, um, which which is a um, um, that um, it has a Q pair which which can take um, requests and receive receive replies. Um, when it's always it's always done as it's always done as a pair. This is this is. Um, an abstraction that's directly supported by the NIC, um, and the um, and then the NIC can can of course talk to the remote can talk to the remote machine you know, through the protocol, and it can actually directly as I mentioned earlier it can directly access memory on the remote machine. And that's called one-sided RDMA, and the reason why it's called one-sided is that all of the operations that are issued are being um, managed um, by the client side. There's, there's, you, there's, you don't, to use this capability, you, you don't run any software on the server. Um, so you can just directly read and write the memory on the server, although there are, there are, there are limitations in being able to do this. Um, the other um, style of access is what's called two-sided RDMA. Um, and it's called two-sided now because the, the server side is also going to be in the network path. 
and and so a request that goes to the server now is is going to be actually picked up. It, it, it's not going to be directly executed. It's going to be picked up just like an, an, an other kinds of network messages by the CPU on the server machine and then interpret it, um, which generally involves accessing memory and then passing stuff back to the client. So it's sort of like a remote procedure call now because the, the CPU on the receiver is, is actually taking the request and, and taking the action based on it. Um, so um, now that, that's the mechanism. It, it, it turns out that in order to get this to work well, there are a lot of knobs to pull. Um, and it's, you're working very close to the hardware doing this kind of work. It's, it's, it's networking. Um, this is, um, there are, you, know, you, you, can, you can control um, the amount of parallelism, asynchrony, batching. You get to use either the one-sided or two-sided operations. Um, and which ways in which you use these capabilities, um, use these capabilities um, is um, is going to depend on exactly what the workload is. How big are the records? Um, how big is the VM? What's your service level objective in terms of, of latency and, and throughput? Um, you know, what's your network configuration and so on? Um, and and it's it's not something that that most applications are going to want to deal with. But but you know somebody in somewhere on this path in the application talking to RDMA, all this, all these decisions have to be made. And, and it makes a pretty big difference. So let's take a very simple example. It's a, um, a YCSB like workload, we're just going to read and write eight byte payloads, um, which are going to be serviced uh, by this remote memory. Um, if we if we configure these choices to be latency optimized, we can get the latency down pretty close to what the network and RDMA hardware can um, can offer, um, which is uh, 4.1 microseconds. Um, but we're only going to get about um, 1.2 million operations per second this throughput. On the on the other extreme, if we want to crank up the messages per second, we can get 200 times that number of messages per second. Unfortunately, the latency is going to go through the roof. Um, if, if we do that, and and of course there's there are many configuration points in between. So this is just to show you that um, there's a lot of performance at stake here. You know, basically a hundred x in in either throughput or latency. So it really it really is important to get this right, and that's mostly what this this uh, work we did ended up focusing on is, is how to do that, um, how to how to get that optimization right. Um, I might add, you know, we learned a lot about just how to get it to work at all, um, but that's just our learning curve and learning how to use how to use RDMA, but but um, which is a, a one-time problem. But but after that, for any given workload, any given network configuration, uh, you face these you face these choices. Um, now, some of those choices can be done statically, but they actually don't. Um, they don't depend so much on, on you know, they're good things to do pretty much in all cases. For example, um, those those message buffers that we're using to send requests back and forth to the NIC, um, you, you've got to, you're going to have a lot of client threads going at those uh, buffers, and, and you really want to do it in a way that there's lot of free communication so that they can, so that they can run in parallel. Um, um, Ideally, you'd like to like to use one-sided RDMA versions because that's going to give you that's going to give you more throughput. You know, as we see, um, there are impediments in you know, some of the things, some of the capabilities that we want to support. Um, and then the uh, those queue pairs, you know, it's basically a pipeline. So you can pump, you know, maybe a queue pair. Let's say it has room for twenty requests. That means you can have twenty requests in flight at the same time. You know, you're going to feed them in sequentially, but they're going to start running, and they may not complete in the order in which in which they were entered, and that's okay, um, because you're basically getting the benefit of having lots of parallel activity on the server. You've sent lots of requests all at once. Um, 
And then there's the question of threat of politicization. As I said, and I'm going to repeat multiple times, you're working, you're really very close to the hardware here. And um, you're, you know, the abstraction of sending and receiving, you know, with those cues, it's all based on polling. So you got to have a thread that's busy waiting. It's basically polling these cues to figure out, um, you know, when something has arrived on the server, or when a reply has arrived on the front. And if 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 you got if it if the wrong thread ends up picking up the request, then you have to move requests between threads in order to get them to in order to get them to execute. And all of that is, is going to cost you. So getting threads to be affinitized to these queues so that um, so that you don't pay for for um, um, for that is is, is important. Um, so this graph is showing the throughput on, on a, you know, based on these these characteristics um, with one client thread, one server thread, and again a small um, a small message with, with no batching, uh, which by the way you can't do any batching with one side of our DMA, which is one of the many pages. Um, and and uh, the same is true for latency where. Each of these capabilities, uh, these static optimizations, will give you a certain amount of, of, um, of performance benefit. Um, um, the the, the, um, the lines here that you see are, are shown in the 99th percentile. So there's quite a bit of variance also. And, and um, the, um, the, the stragglers can the cause, the cause big it can cause big trouble. So tail latency matters. Um, you know, because you're tying up too, you're tying up resources. So um, it's important to uh, be able to cope with the thing as well. Um, so so there's um workload um optimize, um dependent optimizations um are in, in this environment are based on, on four main variables. Um, the number of client threads that you've got pumping requests into um, into this um, client queue manager, um, the number of server threads that are going to be pulling the requests that arrive at the server, and then if you do batching, um, how big are the batches, um, and um, and then also how deep are the queues? You know, just how many requests, how many requests do you have um, in flight at any given time? Um, and so, you know, what what we do here is that for each network distance, um, and um, and and message size, we, you know, we, we we select values for all of these of these parameters. Now, you could do this dynamically, but it's um, it's it's very expensive to to calculate and and determine what the best numbers are. So, what we do is is we statically measure the system. And we we um, create maybe like so sort of think of it as like a pre-compiled plans for what how we're going to set the parameters for for different um, network distances, message size, um, latencies, and throughput. So um, that way, at runtime, we don't have to. Um, you know, we can we can set the parameters. We can set the parameters correctly. Um, based on this this kind of offline static analysis, um, and then at runtime, it's 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 a much you know, we have to still have to search the space, uh, given the the uh, the workload parameters and the network parameters, but but um, but at runtime, it's it's we just have to search these pre-calculated um, up, you know, up, um, throughput and 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 latency measurements in order to get the best. Best configuration. Um, now, it turns out there's too many configurations to measure. Um, you know, we'd, we'd like to do this for all possible values of number of client threads, number of server threads, you know, feed depth, and, and, um, and all, but, but um, and, and batch size. But um, we can't. It, it, it would just take take way too many. Um, so what we what we found was satisfactory was just to do the tests on on, on our our network um, for powers of two um, and 
the uh, starting from a value of one for all of them, and then and then moving forward. Um, the throughput increases with respect to all the parameters. So so um, basically we um, we can we don't you don't really have to push this you know, to the highest possible number. Um, we just have to do it until um, there's so much contention in one of the bottlenecks in the system that the throughput drops. Because at that point we know it, it's not going to get better. Um, so so um, so we just do this evaluation um, un, until it drops, and and um, that turned that in our system that took about fifteen hours um, for. The various, you know, this is for the various network configurations and their various uh, values for all of, of the other of the other parameters, um, which these are the values that uh, that we, we tested for. This is on Azure. This is you know, live. This is real Azure. This is a live system. This is not done in the lab. But such um, that. Um, then online, when you get a request to allocate a cache, um, we scan the parameters um, until until we, we achieve the throughput, and then check the latency. So you know the requirement, the client's requirement, is presumably going to be for a certain amount of latency and a certain amount of throughput, and we may not be able to to give it. It may just not be feasible based on in the way that the system works, but. Um, it's since throughput seems to be the guiding factor here. What we do is we we scan the result of this the um, pre-calculated throughputs for all of these parameters until we get to the smallest value for the parameters that um, that give them give you the desired throughput, and then we look up the latency, um, and hopefully the latency is low enough to um, to satisfy the, the client request. Um, and the um, average time to do this is 27 milliseconds. And so you can have, that means this is, you know, this is on the critical path to allocate the cache. So it you know, tells you that you can allocate a cache uh, very quickly you know, with, with, uh, and, and get something close to the optimal uh, configuration values. And of course, once you know what the top parameters are, you got to set it up. You got to set up the queues. You've got to, Mac, and they've got to set up the batch size and the, the, um, the queue depth and, and you know, all of the runtime uh, mechanisms that will correspond to the values of um, the number of server threads, client threads, batch size, and queue depth that, um, that you decided was appropriate to meet the client's, uh, client's requirements. Um, so, um, so now, We've got you know, so you know, done all the offline work. Now we've got to request it to create a cache. What you know, what has to happen here? Well, the cache manager has to choose a virtual machine with enough memory and enough cores. And and um, it's this is um, you know, normally the, 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 the the VM allocator um, on cloud systems are not necessarily set up to do this easily. Um, and so um, this is an area where you really need to do more work than we have not done yet. But, but um, well, what you'd like to be able to do is to um, grab VMs, preferably ones that have few, if any, cores and lots of memory. Um, that from which we can cobble together this cache that has the amount of memory that's being requested. And um, depending on the latency requirements, you'd like the, um, the network distance of the client to those VMs um, to be um, appropriate. So for you know, normally, you know, there's, there's a hierarchy of switches in the network, um, in the, in the uh, data center network, and the more switches you pass through, um, the higher the latency that the client is going to experience when accessing that remote virtual machine you know, to access that memory. Um, and you know, I have to tell you, current VM allocators don't give you a whole lot of control um, 
to do this, but but um, but that's basically you know, what we need in order to, to um, if we wanted to deploy this um, commercially. Um, it's um, as we'll see, it's better to allocate um, multiple VMs that together have enough memory rather than um, one big VM. Um, and that this is because of our recovery time. Now, the cheapest way to do this is to use spot instances. And you, you may be probably familiar with this concept that um, all of the cloud vendors offer these heavily discounted VMs. Um, but um, the catch is that um, they can take back the VM at any moment. Um, and you've only got somewhere between 30 and 120 seconds, depending on the vendor and the type of of the end um, before you've got, you know, you're going to think you're just going to lose it. So if you care about what's in that cache um, and you use a spot instance, then you better be prepared to, to move the data quickly if, if you get a request from the system to, to uh, reclaim, it, reclaim it the space. Now, the reason why they do this, of course, is that they've got, um, you know, a bunch of VMs allocated on some machine and you know, some of the resources are not being used. And as long as nobody else wants them, they might as well give them away for a little money. Um, but um, as soon as somebody who's willing to pay full fare shows up and wants that resource, then um, they're going to kick you off the machine. Um, and it, it's not paying very much. And they would rather, the cloud provider would rather sell to somebody who's paying um, full, full fare. Um, and, and so if you really need the cash, then you got to be prepared to use, um, um, full fare, um, uh, uh, instances, you know, full price instances, um, uh, when, uh, when there are no spot instances are available, but in the background, you still want to be continue to, to check for cheaper VM so that, you know, you can, you're using full price instances, you can, Offload back to the spot VMs that, that as soon as they're as soon as they're available. But all that is going to be part of your, your VM help here. Um, now, the, is the um, this is a dynamic system. I mean, you know, if you use spot instances, they're going to disappear out from under you. Um, machines do fail. It's possible to just lose a VM entirely with, with, with zero notice. Um, and so you've got to be able to dynamically uh, cope with this um, by allocating the new VM for your cache. Um, in, in one of the scenarios I'm going to describe for you in, um, where we implemented this, the, the, um, the data that's in the cache is actually also in storage. And the reason why we're using the cache is just because it's low latency. So the data is relatively static. And, and that means if we lose a VM, it's okay. We can just reload it from the storage. Um, but um, essentially just regard that as a, as a checkpoint. Um, and that actually is, is a pretty valuable um, usage of this, of this mechanism. Um, if you get a spot, if you have updatable memory and the um, spot instance is reclaimed, then you're going to have to migrate it to a newly allocated virtual machine, well, maybe many machines. And you want to do it as fast as possible. For example, um, the last I looked on Azure, if, if you have a spot instance, the system can reclaim it and it will give you 30 seconds before it's going to grab it and pull your VM. So you've got 30 seconds in which you can move that data from your, your, your VM memory to someplace else before your, your spot VM goes away. Um, so what you want to do is make a bandwidth optimized connection um, to some new VM that has enough space for you. And, and then the fastest way to read it, to, to populate it, is, is to use one-sided argument there. Um, so there's no CPU in the picture. It's just a fire hose that's going to pull data um, from one machine and write it out to write it out to the other. Uh, yeah, maybe that question. 
Uh, I have regarding question uh, the regarding this migrate cash to newly allocated cash. How costly is that? Um. Well, it's it's uh, I mean, there's no cost involved in that, you know, in the sense that um, you're going to use the, you, you've only got the two, you've only got, you've got the second VM running with the first VM for a short time, 30 seconds. So the cost is minimal. Um, but, um, but it, it, it you know, the, the question is how much data can you actually move over the network in the amount of time that you've got available when you really, when you really get it done um, in time. And so um, the latency of this activity is 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 more important than the, the dollar cost, um, and, and and it's very important because you know if, if if you can only move thirty gigabytes in thirty seconds, let's say, and and you've allocated a sixty gigabyte region, you're you're screwed, right? You're not going to be able to move the data fast enough, and and you're going to lose the VM, and you're going to lose the content. Um, now, if, if if it's backed up, if your if your cache is backed up by storage, maybe that's not a big deal. You know, you, you, know, you haven't lost the data. Um, but if it's if it's not backed up by storage, then it's you know, it, it, it's a full tolerance problem. You really lost lost the content. Um, so um, now we 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 actually worked on this one to try to optimize it. It was very very important to to do it as fast as possible. Um, and we implemented two optimizations. One was to allow applications to read the old cache during the migration. Um, and, and, the, um, and why not? I mean, you know, until the old cache goes away, it's, it's sitting there. So uh, might as well, might, as long as it doesn't interfere with the speed in which you can migrate the data. And, and then the other is for write operations. You want, you want to be able to be able to service write operations. Um, that um, and and we can do that by writing to both regions and and only stopping writes to the one region that's being copied. So that argues for moving relatively small amounts of data in chunks, like you know, you know, you move one gigabyte, then you move another gigabyte, then you move the next gigabyte. And you keep track of where you are, so that um, when when the write operation happens, um, you can direct it to the correct copy um, of the cache, the old copy or the new copy, um, and thereby avoid having writes be unavailable. You could just lock the whole cache, you know, during this this region migration, not allow any writes at all, um, but that would be an availability uh, problem. And so by doing it a little bit at a time. And, and, and bookkeeping it, you, you can still allow lights to operate just for that short time of moving one small chunk from one copy to the other that you won't be able to write into that, into that chunk. Um, so uh, um, um, we built it, Sister Royal Lee here, she Jen built it. Um, and um, it's a um, good size system. Um, the um, it's it's all in C plus plus because we wanted to we wanted to measure the performance and we needed to ensure that we were getting the best possible performance in the in C plus plus. Um, many of the applications that wanted to use, that were interested in using it um, are implemented using uh, um, you know, managed um, um, language and so they're having a, a CLR um, common language runtime um, wrapper. For accessing the dot, um, for accessing the, the, the dot that was important. Um, there is um, RDMA is exposed in the, we did this on Windows, and RDMA is exposed in the Windows operating system um, using a, an interface called um, NDSPI. It's like Network Direct Storage, uh, storage something in the place. Um, and it's, um, anyway. It's it's um, it's a standard standard API group that that um, RDMA exposes and um, that Windows exposes. So um, so now let me talk about um, the performance measurements. I'll kind of fly through and just give you like a sense of it, and um, and then I'll talk about case study and how we extended it the whole way. 
more than just needs and needs. Um, so we implemented this is this was the work was done in the future, 20 years ago. Um, so at the time, um, no one asked. Um, still existed and had not been acquired by NVIDIA yet in um, Connect X5, which is the state of the um, networking interface, which is important because it's all about the speed of our DNA. Um, and, the, um, and so, first, you know, can we, you know, what, what's the latency here in its human beings? And that, um, as you can see, the the the, the, um, the latency here is is on average. Ready is the main use system that we're describing, and on average, the latency for small messages is number four microseconds. And, you know, that's pretty close to the best we could get from the hardware. Um, so we're not quite limited by your speed. But, um, there is tail latency to come here. And so the, the median is you know, significantly higher than the, than the median. Um, um, now, the, the, um, the, the packet size, the minimum, the, um, minimal amount of data that's, that's new is, is, um, is about 4K. And up to 4K, and so the um, and so moving, moving, um, reading packet, re reading data that's anything less than the, than the network packet size isn't going to isn't going to help the, the latency. But as soon as you get up to 4K, you start to see um, some some set degradation, and then at higher latencies. Um, at, high, at larger packet sizes, you're going to see much more latency because you've got the same multiple packets. But it's not linear in the size of the um, payload because because we're pipeline. And this is you know the idea of having Q depth and having multiple. You can break it up and you know, you're sending all of the packets at the same time. You, know, you have to wait for the last one to arrive before you can, before you can proceed. But, um, you know, something that didn't come up in the slides, I'm not, I'm not going to say it now because I, I thought I had a slide on it, but it's, you know, let's see, is that um, you cannot batch messages into a packet um, using one-sided RDM. Um, that, um, so let me, let me digress here for a couple of minutes. The way one-sided RDMA works is that at the time you make a connection from the client to the server, um, and this all has to be done in a secure way. You've got to talk to the operating system on the server. You set up some registers that map the client's address space to server memory. And you know this is very dangerous now because you know you're giving the client machine direct access to memory on the server. So it has to be done with access control in a very you know, careful way. Um, once you set up those registers, it's like having a page table, it's like a mapping table um, sitting on the server. At that point, the client can issue read and write operations against the memory on the server and the addresses will be interpreted through the mapping table on the server with no intervention by the server CPU. Um, that mapping table, therefore, it's, it's being interpreted by the, by the NIC on the server. It's how this is how this is done. Um, now, in order to do batching, you would have to have a way of sending a packet of, of messages to the server such that on the server um, it could be unbatched, it could be you know, deserialized in a way that that the server would know you know where the where the messages were in this in this batch um, batch operation. And and um, and of course, there's and there's no way to do to do well. RDMA can't do scatter gather, but it's it's not good enough for this scenario. There are there are limitations there. So, um, so if you want to batch messages, the only way to do it is to use server is to use the server's um, CPU to do the, um, the to do the deconstruction of the message um, on the server side. 
Um, and that requires two-sided RDMA, which is a little slower than one-sided RDMA, partly just because you've got the, C the server CPU in the picture. Doing some, doing some extra work. So when you see this 16, uh, the, these, these um, uh, messages of, you know, there are four, there are four, um, there's 16K, um, those are actually being constructed as a batch from multiple smaller messages. And this is all being done using two-sided RDMA. So you do get a lot of benefit out of pipelining the messages. And this is nowhere near four times the latency of, of one message. Um, but there is additional overhead because of the two-sided RDMA that's used in order to, to control the batching. Um, um, I don't have a slide here on the write operations, but the write operations actually for the small ones are actually a bit faster. And the reason is that when the client sends the request message to write on the server, the parameter for the this space in that message, in the request message for the data, um, provided that it's less than 172 bytes. So in other words, you've got a field in there in the request message that you're sending to write on the remote machine. And so if it fits in the request, then you can do it in one message instead of first sending the request and then sending the data. If you want to send any more than 172 bytes, then it's too, you know, at the network level, the network transport level, there will actually be two messages. The client won't, the client software will see it, but but the latency will be affected by that. And so the small writes are actually a little faster than the reads because the reads are always two, right? You got to send a request to read and then you got to move the data back. So you always have two network messages sitting there. Yeah. Um, and then throughput, um, is um, again, this is all based on on, on using the uh, the optimization framework that I described. Um, is is um, in, and, and for small messages we batch like crazy, so measured in messages per second, you know, um, that um, you know it looks it looks pretty good. Um, that um, you know, ultimately you're constrained by the network bandwidth in our case. 100 gigabit network. Um, and as um, as the message sizes um, increase, then of course the number of messages per second goes down because you're doing messages um, are needed in order to saturate, in order to saturate the network. Um, as you can see, the batching benefit, you get batching benefit up to um, um, up to about 256 bytes and that and there on basically the three point the, the grades as a little function of the message size because you know, you're set you're saturated. Um so we want to check I mean, one of the other things we checked is is whether you could um in actually meeting our service level objectives in terms of, of the um, and latency and the, of the cache that we have located. Um, remember, we're only doing it in factors of two. So given the throughput and latency that's requested by the client, um, we have to interpolate between those points in order to um, in, in order in, in order to choose the right values of the parameters. We don't actually have one of them. On every uh, one of those four parameters, number of client threads, server threads, um, batch size, and the feed um, And what we met, what we measured, it turns out that you know, we always hit our point. That that's the high level message is that um, uh, you know we we almost always get better latency than what the user requested, um, and um, and the throughput is is generally on the mark um, for relative to what was requested. So remember, remember the way we did the search in, in the you know, optimization space is we we start from a um, a latency optimized configuration, and then we increase the parameters until we hit the throughput required. And as we do that, the latency gets worse and worse. Um, but but and then we stop as soon as we hit. The value of parameters that that was satisfied 
satisfy the people. And so that's what it's going to be. Um, so it worked. Um, remember, we had an object, there was this question of region um, migration. Um, and we had two optim we had two optimizations. Uh, one was was that we allow reads from the old um, the old VMs while we're copying to the new VMs, and the other was that we we move one section at a time um, so that write operations are only delayed if they're going into the small section that's actually in flight. And what maybe it's not worth trying to puzzle out the graph, but what these dips on um, the input um, are is, is, is what happens if you don't use our optimizations. And if you do use our optimizations, then you get this nice smooth um, transcript of um, the data from, from, old, from old to new. And what we, at least in our network, what we found is we could move up to about 30 gigabytes um, in 30 seconds before the spot instance was going to be is going to be deallocated. So what that means is that when you can, you can you can build a cache of any size, but it's just you need to make sure the VMs are only at 30 gigabytes, which is a relatively small VM. Um, another thing about VM um, allocation is that um, you know all of these cloud providers they offer uh, VMs in, in very in fixed sizes. You know you don't get to vary it any way you want. And, and getting VMs that have very little CPU and a fair bit of memory, they often don't offer. And, and so if you were gonna deploy this in, in a, um, by a cloud service provider, then you'd really want to have some customized VM sizes that are friendly to the use of this kind of cache because the current VM sizes are not. Um, they just um, you end up with either too many cores or not enough memory. Okay, it's, it's you end up paying for resources that you don't need. Okay. So that's that's it for the measurements. Let me tell you how we actually um, ended up using it. Which um, if you, I I don't know if you, how many of you are familiar with the faster key value store that was developed here on group, but it's it's pretty widely used inside Microsoft and, um, as of last. Uh, Earlier this week, I think, um, they, they have a whole new version of the software for Garmin, which is a Redis compatible um, version of the technology. It's a whole new stack, lots of different things. Um, gathering GitHub stars in amazingly fast rates. So people really love this technology. And, and the way it works is, is um, it's key value store. So you've got to map keys to locations. And so the way, it, the way it works is that in memory, there's a hash index that maps, um, that, that covers the entire key space. And, and for each key, when you hash it into the index, you get an address of the physical location of that key. Storage is, 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 is a log. It, it, it's entirely log structured. The tail of the log is sitting in main memory, and the rest of it is out on on um, cloud storage or server local storage. <laughs> and and some of the tail, the tail of the tail, is is updatable, um, and then the rest of it is is read only. And I think over time, this is the way it's described in the paper. But over time, they realized that. It was probably better to keep the mutable stuff separate, and so it, it's not exactly the tail. It's kind of a, it's, it's a data structure sitting on the side for the for the updatable records, and then when they're no longer updatable, then they're appended to the real part of the of the log. Now, as updates, it's it's an append only storage. So as updates um, ar arrive, um, they're appended to this log, and eventually you run out of main memory. Um, at that point, you've got to take the oldest part of the tail and push it out into storage. And, and, and they have the policies for them to do that and how big are the chunks that are moved in many, many out into storage. Um, 
the interface to do that, it's a fixed interface. And so the client um, that's deciding um, to write this stuff out, it doesn't really know what kind of storage is sitting on the other side of that interface. You know, it just issues operations to this API and we have implementations for this that will go out to multiple layers of storage. And it was designed to handle hierarchical storage. So you could have different kinds of storage of different costs, different latencies, and so on. And, and so when you, when you, if you've got a piece of the tail of the log now that you want to write out to storage, it will get, this interface will write it out to all of the storage devices um, in the hierarchy. Right? And, and you can choose in what order they, they get written out. And so what we did is, is we, 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 we set it up so that um, the ready cache was the fastest part of this storage hierarchy. Um, and then the next, the next higher layer was an SSD. It's actually server local SSD, which is about the best you're gonna get if you have some things. So, so um, every time a piece of the log got pushed out to storage, it was, it was written both to, to um, um, to the disk and to the and and to main memory to this this um, this ready log. Um, and the reason why this is a good idea is that the cache has much lower latency than the SSD. So so um, you know it's a really it's a really good idea. And and they um which saying what I said with um. So you got a three level, you got a three level hierarchy of storage. You got main memory, you've got the remote main memory, which is in ready, and then you've got the SSD. And what we showed is that this gives way better performance than than um, when ready is not in the picture. This you knows really beneficial to have this have this main memory that um, and and so. Uh, we, we looked at um, both the throughput of using SMB Direct, which is a built-in API in Windows to be able to write to, to disks, and to SSD as a, another alternative. And as you can see, the throughput in writing to this remote memory cache is, is hugely better than writing to either um, to SMB Direct to, to or, or, or directly to the server of the system. Um, so, you know, if this were available, we expect, if we actually made this available on Azure, um, then we expect this would be a pretty, pretty popular uh, capability. Okay, so that's the cache manager. And I'm about to move on to talk about how to add stored procedures. But, you know, you guys put some more things in play. So, you know, if you have any questions about the system as I described it so far, you could turn to stop and think. Oh. Um, last part is, is much shorter. Um, that um, So the next step in talking to people how they want to use this cache is um, there seem to be scenarios where people want to store a graph. That's a killer. I mean, if you store a graph that there, how are you going to traverse this graph? I mean, you're going to send a message every time you follow a pointer in the graph, I mean, back and forth across the network. That's going to be terrible. Uh, that's not going to affect that. The performance is going to be unbearable. So the only way to do this is to be able to support um, code that's running on the server to traverse the data structures. So you need server-side pointer chasing. But the problem is, in order to do that on the server, you got to know the cache addresses. You know, because when the, the client who's writing the software that's going to run on the server, you know, they think they've got this, this contiguous address space from zero to, you know, to n. But those that, that the addresses on the server, I mean, they're going to be on, first of all, they're going to be on multiple servers, you know, using the technique I described. And, you know, they're just going to be arbitrary addresses. So you got to have some way of doing the address mapping. How are you going to do that? Um, 
And so what we did is we exposed that as a, um, as a function um, that will translate cash addresses, both the address and the size, into a local address so that the client can write code that runs on the server um, that will directly access memory um, using the correct addresses as they exist on the server. But the code can be written using the address space as it is exposed to the client. Um, and then you know, and then it's up to us in our system called CompuCache, it's up to us to do this translation. And the way we do it is that we construct, the client constructs the mapping, a mapping table that knows which regions of memory are being mapped, you know, extent-based addressing, which extents of memory are being mapped to which parts of physical memory. And at binding time, it sends that, um, um, that table over to the server, which, which can then use it to, it to implement the translate function on the server so that the client can, can do these direct accesses. Um, so it's a cache address that's a physical address. Um, um, now, another problem is remember the cache is not just one virtual machine multiple virtual machines, right? You can sort of spread it out. The client has no idea where those boundaries are, right? And we, a priori, we don't know. You know, it just depends on the size of the virtual machines that we can grab on behalf of the client. Um, so what do you do about the fact that the address space is going to span virtual machine boundaries? Well, there's, there's a couple things you can do. One is... Um, you can do data shipping. You know, if if the if the stored procedure running on the server spans, you know, goes past the end of the virtual machine that it's running on, you could copy the data from the next virtual machine in the address space and bring it over to the to the caller so that the caller can execute on that data where um, on the machine where the stored procedure is running. Data, classic data shipping. You know, so you know, here you've got server one, um, which is one of, one of the servers that's running a region of the cache. You've got server two running another region of the cache. Um, you've got this stored procedure running on server one and, and it wants to access the data. So what you could do is you could just copy the data over to server one so that the stored procedure on server one can access. That's one possibility. The other possibility, obviously, is the opposite. You could ship the function to the other server, you know, to run over there. Um, and now, now you got to make this programmable. How are you going to expose these two capabilities to an application developer who's writing a stored procedure? And and so the way we did it is we have these two functions that we offer as part of the service. Um, data flow and function flow. Um, so data flow takes the um, the data and and uh, moves it to some address on the client. And function flow flows the um, function to the server um, and gives it the addresses, you know, and passes along the addresses that are going to be accessed because the translation, the address translation now has to happen on a different server. So, so you've got to pass the logical addresses over there so that the new server will know what data to access for that thing. The other thing is you could just throw up your hands and say, you know, you didn't think this function was going to span two, two VMs, and so we'll just, you know, just take an exception and end the procedure call and return to the call. Um, the uh, runtime to make this happen um, has a, a bunch of complexities. Um, you know, our RDMA is not gonna be enough now because we basically are doing a remote procedure call. And what we used was a low latency um, remote, remote procedure call, ERPC, developed by Anuj Kalia, his PhD thesis at CNEO. Which networks for us here in Microsoft. 
doing other things, but thank God. And we ran it over um, a kernel, the kernel bypass um, library that's offered to avoid op current operating system kernel overhead, um, or you can run it over RDMA. Got it to run it. Um, that um, the uh, batch operation requests to make it more efficient so you can get more operations per second. Um, and we, we chose to have the batch size dynamically. Um, and the um, and then we also um, use one server thread um, per core um, in, to, for, for polling on the server because moving requests between cores is is um, is costly. We, we want to uh, we want to avoid that. There's actually um, you know, there's there's our you know, receiver side scaling RSS which. Is commonly used in order to avoid the um, to be able to be dynamic to the number of cores and also to, to uh, limit the amount of cross core uh, communication. So this bunch of work on some of the tech people. Um, um, these the, this data flow function um, becomes you got to schedule these these operations. So when you get a data flow function invoked, um, you, you want to stop executing that operation, transfer the data from server two to server one, and then resume the request after the data has arrived. And you don't want to waste the CPU core while you're doing that. So you've got to have some way of, of doing um, multitasking on that on the, on the core to make this efficient. Um, if you're moving the function from one core to the other, then you, you basically have to terminate the, the stored procedure on, on server one. It's, it's done. There's nothing more for it to do. And then spin up a new copy of the operation on the server, picking up from where it left off, which means you have to include the... Um, oops, you have to include the context for that. Um, and then the whole server migration thing, nothing to that. It's, um, but um, it's basically the same as what we did for ready. You got to copy the data over um, the extra complexity that you got to deal with this, this translated mapping. Whenever you move data from one physical cache to another, then the mapping from the address space to the, to the physical addresses has changed, so you're gonna to have to include that as part of the, as part of the migration, but the rest of it is, is, uh, is, is straightforward and more or less what you need to do. So, um, so um, that's the story. Um, I my, my take on this is um, in talking to uh, the folks in Azure, and, and by the way, it's not uniquely an Azure problem, it's a well-known problem, like all the all the hyperscalers, the same speed as Google and AWS, is just a ton of unused memory. And if the uh, network in infrastructure can expose it for data management, it should. I think this is it's really kind of a no-brainer. Um, but it does require um, it, it does require to, to do it well, you need RDMA, and, and RDMA is a problem. Uh, currently, none of, as far as I know, none of the uh, cloud providers offer RDMA um, in in the VM, um, abstracted and protected. It's it's everybody says it's coming, but it's it's not. They've been telling us this for years, so probably it is coming. But but the problem with it is that um, you've got to virtualize the NIC because. You know, when when if you're running a virtual machine and it's got direct access to another machine's memory, then um, you only want the two virtual machines that are talking to each other to have the privilege to do this remote memory access. Otherwise, it's a huge security hole. And and you know it, it requires special capability on the NIC. You know, you've got to have contexts on the NIC for different VMs running on the host. It gets, it gets complicated. Um, you can do it even on elementary NICs uh, with some limitations. But but um, 
the cloud vendors have resisted offering it because they know that more powerful NICs are coming that will allow them to virtualize the NIC. And so they don't want to do the work twice. They don't want to go through all this work to virtualize the NIC in some very hacky way with limited hardware support. And then three, four years later, the whole thing is going to be virtualized and you know at the hardware level it would be easy. Um, and then they have to go through it all over again. Um, at least that's what they tell. That's what they call it. So, so, um, but it is, it is coming. Um, and when it is, you know, I think you know, this is something we might see like a year or two from now, if Guardian may appear as, as it's supposed to, um, that, um, you know, you, you, you'd be able to uh, be able to support this kind of, of remote crash capability. Um, now, given what I just said about it being unavailable, um, if you were listening hard, you may recall early on, they said I measured all this stuff on Azure. And it was like, well, how the heck did you do that? Just told me that RDMA isn't available um, on any of these, on any of these platforms. And the answer is, we actually, Azure does offer RDMA, but only on high-performance computing clusters. So why on high what, what is it about high-performance computing? Uh, the answer is the high-performance computing clusters, each VM maps one-to-one -one the physical piece of hardware. In other words, there's no, you no, there's no um, multi-tenancy where you have multiple VMs on the same on the same box. And if, if you do that, then you don't have to virtualize the NIC. You know, it's like either. The client machine has access to memory on the remote machine, or it doesn't. You know, it doesn't. You know, there's no sharing going on, and so they allow it. Um, and and that was that's the environment in which we did all of our all of our data center um, testing and measurement. Um, so you could actually do this today, but only on the high performance computing clusters, which are big. Big um, machines, you know, just, just by the nature of the beast, you know, by the big PC. So, um, if you wanted to do this with a small cache, you know, a moderate sized cache with just a couple of cores, you couldn't do it because they don't have machines like that in the high performance computing cluster. You know, they only have big machines. So, so we are using their party in a very inefficient way in order to get our. So that's it. So the Ready uh, paper was published in BLDB a couple of years ago. It's a copycat um, paper in Cider. Unfortunately, we've not been able to make the software available open source someday. We can end up resuming work. Right now, they're working sitting on the shelf waiting for our Um, That's me, onward. Thank you, Phil. We promised Phil to finish by 4.15. We're past that, but maybe we can. No, take... we can go to half past. Half past. Okay. Okay. Arman had his hand up. Arman, why don't you ask your question? And then there's one in Q&A. Uh, Arman, are you there? Yeah. Okay, he, he, he typed it into the Q&A to answer that. But the key is, even current trends are hard to do, do you think that then we're going to write this again? That we know that it's going to grow. I don't know that it's going to grow. Um, well, latency, well, la latency doesn't include that much. I mean, bandwidth is what's, is what's that's getting better. Um, so it's really a question of if the answer to your question is how how much latency out of our of, of SSDs is likely to improve over time. And, you know, it's it, it's been on the order of a hundred hundred microseconds best for, for, for a while now. And that may just I don't really know enough about the physical media you know, flash memory that it, it's probably dated by that. So maybe it's not actually completely you know, 
money. But um, I don't think you're likely to see the network vacancy increase very much. Um, but you will see the bandwidth increase by, um, by quite a bit, and it's moving very fast now. Going from 100 gigabits to 200 to 400 to 100, 1.6 terabits. I think, this is, you know, I think AWS has SKUs at least 800 gigabits. I don't think Azure is also quite that. That's the end. But um, just how fast we can go in the hardware. We're all, we're all buying the same hardware. It, it chips are not a great secret. Um, so, Phil, there are two hands up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is regarding the when you showed the uh, pointer traversal in different servers through the translator, which uh, converts the C and size to the address, local address, right? So is it like is it part of the operating system which is uh, running, or is should be the part of the DBMS system? Um, well, it's 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 part of our cache manager running server side. Um, you know, if there were hardware assistance, then probably you could make it faster. Um, and you know, we don't like the fact that we're offloading this to the application. It's not nice to have to write an application that is right. cognizant of the fact that physical memory is mapped differently than client memory. Um, but um, on the other hand, it's, it's we just couldn't figure out how to do it um, any other any other way. So uh, I don't know. I mean, maybe some of you have an idea of stuff that's being exposed. It's just an expedient. You had to do something. That's what you think. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Arman. I'm actually talking to Amin's uh, system. Uh, my question was, can you go to the page 29? Yeah. Uh, so when you're doing at uh, FF flow, you're sending your functions. It's actually the server thread that's responsible for uh, executing that function, right? Yes. But from what I understood, uh, the number of server threads are actually at most uh, the same uh, number of the same as a uh, number of client threads, and that's at most. So they're usually less uh, server threads than client threads. Doesn't that actually make it some kind of a bottleneck or something? It doesn't it uh, in uh, increase the latency of doing the function, especially since there is much less computation power on our server here. Um, that, um, because you know, most of the connections are, of course, client to server. Um, this requires a server to server connection. And so now, are you multiplexing that on the same core, or do you have do you have a separate um, separate channel for server to server connection to dedicated cores? Do this kind of thing. Okay. Maybe we we'll take it just play it with only in the top of it. And the fact is, maybe a more interesting question is what what should we do? <laughs> you know, what's, what would be a good way of handling it? It, it, it kind of depends on, on how frequently this function should be. Um, the data shipping I mean, it, I mean, it could even be done with um, RDMA, um, but the, the function shipping definitely requires a method connection and ability to make procedure calls. So, if it's if it's a relatively rare event to cross the machine boundaries, then probably you could just connect up to a core that's also receiving client because the server can have a core that's maybe more likely where the boundaries for client request because of service server to server. I see the the thing that was I 
uh, on my mind was that because there are more clients than servers, so servers are actually quite busy with answering clients. So if we push more work even between servers or from client to servers, uh, when servers want to do more work, it's uh, can take much more longer, and that's what I was that's what I was thinking. So, um, that would be true if we supported microcontrollers, but we don't. And that actually would be a very interesting line of it. And that's true for Ready as well. When you can you can support multiple client threads, but not multiple clients. And the um, the problem, of course, with multiple clients is that um, we need to do arbitration on the server. And I'm not even sure what the requirements are there, much less what a good way to arbitrate. But you're quite right, just from a resource management standpoint. So, the resource balancing is not good. Any more questions of uh, Phil? I'm checking the ha uh, raised hands and I don't see any. And yeah, nothing on. Yep. It is okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have a one. Uh, so my question is uh, say when a cache server searches for a node that has enough memory to, uh, to write cache, uh, would it take any measure to avoid nodes that have workloads that may need entire unused memory? Uh, at some point of their uh, life cycles. I'm sorry, could you say it again? I didn't understand. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So my question is, would the the would the cache server um, uh, uh, take any measures to avoid, uh, say, the nodes that might need to use the entire uh, uh, unused memory? Uh, for its future workload? No, it's it's very unlikely. Um, the um, I, I forget what it is. The, there's actually a paper about the um, VM allocator on Azure, and the rate at which they they allocate VMs is astonishing. I mean, you know, it's like thousands of VMs per second kind of thing. I mean, it's just unbelievable. You know, that's it. the scale of of a worldwide hyperscale. The numbers are huge, so you. Would, I, I don't think they would ever statically set aside capacity, um, you know, for for growth on the same server. I think they would just count on the fact that there's enough headroom on the service overall that if you wanted to grab another VM on a certain size, it's very likely to be. Okay, but the uh, but the scheduling is. Or that uh, uh the red it's determined based on you know uh the current capacity of the uh, the memory capacity of the node right what if let's say uh at the point of right uh that that say the strained memory is gone it's no longer strained it's it's taken fully by the workload that's running on that server um would that be possible? This might be a good one for the email conversation to make sure about the scenario exactly. But, um, but I, I, I mean, I stand by it. I think, I think the uh, allocating a VM is, a, is an atomic operation um, that um, the, the VM allocators you know, dealing with massive amount, massive numbers of servers and things in the It's just not, not going to do anything by way of preparing for some future request that, that might show up. It's just, it's, I mean, it's just, it's just not enough time. As it is, it's heuristic. I mean, the, you know, the, the bin packing problem of, of choosing VMs for, um, that are mapped to a given physical server is already infeasible. 
I mean, there it's, it's, it's so the solution is highly heuristic because otherwise they could never do it fast. Okay. But if you're interested, you know, drop me an email and like can develop it further. And I can paint you with the, the work that describes how the other application is actually Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I think we passed the time that we promised. Well, I'll, I'll take one more. And then we'll okay, one more? Stuff. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, two, two quick minutes. question and then we end. Yeah. It's possible. I mean, oh, yeah. stayed up from last Stay up from previous, from previous case. case. Okay. All right. Well, if there are any follow-on questions, okay. um, you know, yeah. drop me an email or you know, feel free to um, contact Xi Zhen. Um, yeah, we, that, I'm sure he'd be delighted to hear from you. Yeah. 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 In, Thank in you very much again, to, Phil. Yeah. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care. Yeah. We'll you see you. Bye bye. Bye bye.